well as the moderator, it's up to me to speak first, I guess. Anne is my hero and uh, the world's leading genius. And uh, I'm crazy about her. And, uh, you, you don't need an introduction of Anne because I'm sure you all know her well. You can't hear me. I'm Mike, and you can't hear me? I can hear you. Now it's better. Now I have to talk louder. That's better. All right. Thank you. Um, and also, we don't, uh, I think, want to have just this little private, intimate conversation. We'd like to have an immersive conversation and really invite you early on to ask questions or make remarks, whatever. Um, Can I actually say then, um, because th there was such a great atmosphere, we, we, we both arrived early because we're both nerds. And we sat here and people came in and there was music playing and everybody, didn't it feel like a salon? <laughs> so I wonder, Brad, up there, if you mind turning some of the house lights back up again? Are you up there? The other Brad? There's two Brads. Uh, yeah, just so we can see ourselves. I'm being an unbearable director. I'm directing already. <laughs> directing the evening and the lighting. How's that feel? Anything better? Yeah. You can see each other. So I would love to keep, keep that atmosphere, which is precious, that kind of talking to each other and not looking down like this all the time. That's radical. I interrupted you, Chuck. You did? <laughs> Chuck, keep going. Chuck is my hero, too. He actually, he, he married me. Well, and Anne married me and my wife. <laughs> Right, I mean, got it. <laughs> I married Chuck, and Chuck married me. But Chuck married me and Rena, Rena and I. Is that proper English? Yes, I conducted the ceremony. <laughs> and I conducted, and conducted the ceremony, the ceremony uh, for me and my wife, Michi. You know, the funniest thing uh, was, was Chuck's marriage which is he actually, I think he called me up at some point and he said, will you, will you marry me? <laughs> he asked if I would marry him and Nietzsche. And uh, I said, sure, but what do I need to do? And he said, well, we'll take care of all the official stuff. Uh, you just have to show up for the marriage. And I said, okay. So he said, uh, at another point, he said, okay, we're gonna get married in a uh, a Chinese restaurant in Queens. <laughs> so I thought, okay. And then he said, at another point, he said, I'm going to send a car for you. I said, you don't have to send a car for me. He said, I'm sending a car for you. So the, the book is called What's the Story? I'm just telling a story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Stories communicate things. So I went in the car, and uh, we showed up, indeed, in the middle of Queens, in the middle of Queens, and I walked up these stairs and looked around in this vast restaurant and there were about 200 people that were starting to arrive. That's how many people were there, ish, right? Ish. They were the, the, the theater's who's who in this restaurant in Queens. Everybody was there, all the directors, really great Broadway singers. Parenthetically, what he, what he or, or prepared was a, a karaoke guy, a guy who goes from wedding to wedding with his karaoke machine, and a 13-course meal. That was all that was prepared. I came in and I thought, oh my god, he didn't want me to marry him. He wants me to direct the day. <laughs> and so I rolled up my sleeves, and I started walking over to these directors who I esteem highly, like Robert Woodruff and David Schweitzer and... I mean, all these great directors were out, and I went up to them and I said, okay, what's the strongest line in this room? Because <laughs> we got, I got to marry them. <laughs> because I kept coming up to Chuck and Michi and saying, do you have any plans? They said, no, there's a 13-course meal. <laughs> and so, so um, and, and we, and oh, Martha Clark was there, and I said, okay, which, what, well, we decided the strongest line in this huge upstairs restaurant in Queens was through the center. And so I thought, well, some, People need to know what's going on. So I picked up the microphone and I, I said, ladies and gentlemen, this is welcome to the marriage <laughs> of Chuck and Michi. Um, what you're going to do is you're going to, uh, you're going to eat six courses and at the end of the sixth course, I'm going to marry them and they're going to get married and then you can have the rest of your courses. 
Meanwhile, there's a karaoke machine over here. Meanwhile, this karaoke guy, who clearly went from wedding to wedding all over the boroughs, his face, because we're talking some of the major Broadway singers getting up and saying, uh, getting up and singing karaoke, and the, belting these songs, and this karaoke guy was, he'd never seen anything like it. <laughs> So anyway, so that's going on. They get six courses go by, and I get up. It's a hot day, and I'm schwitzing like crazy. I get the microphone, and I say, OK, ladies and gentlemen, uh, clear this space in the middle. Um, uh, uh, Chuck, you're going to get on this side. Michi, you get on this side. I put one daughter behind Chuck and one daughter behind Michi. And I said, this is the way it's going to go. Because you know, ritual is important, and you have to get ritual in the right order, correct? Mm -hmm. I said, this is the way it's going to go. I'm just making it up. This is the secret to directing. <laughs> <laughs> What's going to happen is you both need to start walking towards each other. Now, this is the who's who of New York theater scene is, is, is now, after their sixth course, watching. And you're going to walk towards each other, and you have to find a consent to stop. And after you stop, I can't remember exactly the order I said, but it was very important, the order at the time. I said, you, uh, you, the, the daughters are going to give you the rings. You exchange the rings, and then you kiss. And once you've done that, you're married, OK? <laughs> so they both look very nervous. They all look nervous. And they walk towards each other, and they stop. And then they got the order wrong. I can't remember what it was, <laughs> but they got the, And I was standing there going, holy. No, the order, the order what, that we got wrong was, I thought, wow, there's Michi. What a chance to kiss her. So I kissed her. <laughs> so I had to go, stop. Start again. Back. We're going to start this whole thing over again. And then they got it right, and then they were married. <laughs> and that's the end of my story. <laughs> what are we going to talk about now? <laughs> What's the story, Chuck? I have to, I mean, I don't know how many of you have read Anne's book, um, but uh, I've read it twice now. And um, it's fantastic and so rich and full of 728,622 stories, uh, so that it's a very rich, it's not like a, Anne talks about what's the story as though there's one simple narrative line going through her life in the book. But what's beautiful is this incredibly rich life of multiple narratives and stories and characters and events and things. And um, one thing I'm reminded of <clears throat> is how much Anne is one of the world's greatest listeners. Um, so that she listens to what's going on in the world and in life and in the theater and with actors and when she goes to a show and all the rest of it, it reminds me. I had an old friend uh, named Dick Fisher uh, who when we first met in our 20s and when we came to New York and he worked in the admissions department at Princeton, which he said was kind of a boring job and he thought it might be really fun to be an investment banker. So he went back to business school, he came out, he got a job at Morgan Stanley um, when it had, I think, 152 employees. And when he retired as president and chairman of the board, it had 62,000 employees worldwide, by some measures the largest investment bank in the world. And he had done it all because it was fun. He was not greedy. He, went home and had dinner with his family every night, and then they would go to the theater or go out to concerts and stuff like that. Um, he never had a cell phone because he didn't want to be bothered uh, in his personal life. Because uh, in the middle of the night, people would always try to call him. And what I think it was fun, and also he was the world's greatest listener, so that I would see we would go into a meeting and everybody would say what they thought. And Dick wouldn't be saying anything until finally he would think, yeah, great. I think that's a great idea. Let's do that. And that was the decision. And Anne in rehearsal, I, I mean, the city company in rehearsal uh, 
the lighting designer is giving the actors acting suggestions. The actors are telling the sound designer what to do. The sound designer is telling the lighting designer what to do. Um, uh, the actors are telling each other what to do and is saying nothing. Uh, and then the next day, Anne will say, Leon, you remember when you came down stage here and then you said that thing and then you turned around um, and threw Bondo across the uh, stage into the audience? Uh, that was cool. <laughs> That's the decision. So that finally the piece went through one psyche and came out coherent. But it was the psyche that was the best listener on the planet Earth, uh, except for my friend Dick Fisher. They, they, <laughs> they tied. They tied. Thank you. I should have gone into investment banking. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? No. How can we, how can we, uh, it's, it's such a good feeling in this room. And I'm so appreciative that you're here this evening and I think I share that with Chuck. How can we keep this an open conversation? Yeah, let's. Yeah. Why not? This is radical, right? We're not supposed to open this right. up so early. <laughs> it's, it's iconoplastic. Can we talk about the book without having read it? Sure. Sure, what do you think of it? <laughs> <laughs> we meaning everybody. And I've, I've known, all I know about the book so far is what you just said about it. I didn't even know there was a book until a few days ago. I'll, I'll jump in and, and, and just take your, your uh, generous uh, hook on your fish. I, I grew up as a postmodernist. I grew up deconstructing with great gusto and thrill. Um, I was not born in the modernist era. I was born in, in an era where we um, looked at what had once been hierarchical. And certainly in the theater, you say, you start with the text, which is followed by what would come second in the modernist theater? I forget. The director. <laughs> right. Anyway, if you imagine you tip this whole column of, of important things, say lighting is at the bottom or costumes are at the bottom or, uh, and you tip it all over and it falls into pieces and you pick up each, uh, each uh, uh, element, light, sound, and you say this one is no more important than anything else. So I brought up, I was brought up and I continue to, with great thrill, deconstruct everything I deconstructed everything that I got my hands on. But I feel that we've gotten to a point in um, the organization of our social lives together that we've deconstructed to the point where nothing means anything anymore. And that um, it doesn't make sense to further deconstruct. And Suddenly, in this new ism that nobody's created a word for, postmodernism is followed by what? I don't like the word constructivism, but there's something about constructing or reconstructing. Is the issue of wh whose stories do we tell now? Who are they for, and how do we tell them? And it. It literally happened, it actually happened in a rehearsal, it was in um, a number of years ago, I was working on a play called Going, Going, Gone. And it was, um, <laughs> it, was an, it was about the breakthroughs in quantum and astrophysics. And um, can I take you through this whole story? It's another story, but I think it comes to the issue of this book, finally. Um, I remember reading it was on the front page of the New York Times Sunday Magazine in the 90s at some point. They, if anybody remembers who was alive back then and living, <laughs> Stephen Hawking was on the cover. You remember that issue? And Stephen Hawking essentially said, his author's message in this article was, the breakthroughs in quantum physics are so extreme and important that we have to understand them as lay people. Everyone needs to study them. Because 
If you understand what's happening in quantum physics, it will change your understanding of life, of relationships, of death, of everything. So I thought, oh, okay, I'm going to study quantum physics and I'll throw in astrophysics while I'm at it. And so I started buying these books called like physics, for, uh, quantum physics for dummies, you know those books, or for beginners, or because and I'm really bad at, um, at uh, mathematics. When it comes to an equation, I get really confused and always have. Anyway, so I got all these books and I'd think, in the spirit of Stephen Hawking, I'm going to try and figure this out. So I'd start reading and I'd get to a point in the book where an equation appeared and I just shut down and I, I couldn't go further. I put the book down. A couple of months later, I pick up another book, be reading along. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting equation. I put it down. I couldn't get through these books, and I couldn't. I couldn't understand. So around that time, I was. It was. We were working. City Company was working a lot at Actors Theatre of Louisville, and I always liked to drive my car, which is a 14-hour journey. So I decided to get books on tape, and it was tape in those days, not CD. This is the mid 90s, and so I started driving to Louisville, to and from Louisville. I remember driving to Louisville, and I put one of the books on tape on quantum physics for dummies, whatever it was, into the, and, and I kept driving, and I would listen, it was very interesting, and then would come a part that I didn't understand, but because it's on tape, I didn't, I didn't take it out, I just let it play, and so I'd forget about what was being spoken through the, the, the book being read. I'd look at the landscape, and look at the clouds, and just uh, was having a lovely time, and suddenly I'd say, Holy crap, I just un understood Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. <laughs> or, oh my god, I just got uh, Einstein's special relativity. And, and what I learned is that, and it's what they call in physics fuzzy logic, is you can't actually understand something by studying it too hard directly, that you actually have to move away. It's the way we innovate, right? We, we get our best ideas when we're not thinking about something, when we're asleep or taking a walk or something like that. And what started happening as I listened to these books on tape and relaxed, I started indeed understanding the breakthroughs in quantum physics to a certain extent. And indeed, my understanding of life, relationships, death, every work, everything changed. Now, as a theater director, I am dedicated to sharing the thrill that I get from research with an audience. Through the actors I work with, through the designers, I started thinking, how can I, and it's also actually to add a little more truth, I'm a little bit lazy. And I know that if I work on a play about something, I'll study it deeper because there are people involved, if you know what I mean. So I thought, how could we do a play where the audience has the same experience as I do driving in the car? How, how is it possible um, that the audience can, I can provide an experience where the audience uses their fudgy, fudgy logic, their fuzzy logic. So <clears throat> I thought, well, uh, I started collecting about 200 pages of possible text that I thought would be interesting to be said. But meanwhile, I was thinking, I need a structure and a story that's very compelling. It should be a play that everybody knows. It's something about, well, drunkenness would help, and like a long night would help. <laughs> couples would help, because there's a lot of couples in thinking about quantum physics. <laughs> Are you getting to guess the play I chose? <laughs> Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? To make the story a little shorter, <clears throat> four actors from City Company. What, I, I did a cutting of Edward Albee's brilliant play, brilliant play cut it from its two and a half hours length to about an hour and a half, and asked the actors to memorize the text. And, uh, and we started to rehearse that version of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? And I said, what, what you need to do is that I need to be able to close my ears and understand everything that I'm seeing so that I get the story through my eyes. And so, you know, hand me a drink, had to have a hand me a drink. I needed to see it. So it was, it's a little bit paid by numbers, but it also, it's a great play and it can be very emotional. And so once the entire play was staged, bit by bit, all of the sections of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, I said, get rid of the text. Well, the actors knew beforehand this was going to happen. It's not like I told them to memorize it and then it was going to go away. 
-hmm. We didn't use a word of the Albi. And I said, what we need to do now, now that the play is staged, is to replace the text. This is the ultimate version of deconstruction, right? This is super, super postmodernism. To replace the text with a scientific text about quantum and astrophysics. So, uh, uh, and it has to be in exactly the same, what's the word, like cadence or, scan. it has to scan the same as the <coughs> Alvi text. So we started at the top, and the four actors were like skimming through their pages, you know, pour me a drink, da 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 And they would find the subject we were on, if we were on string theory, or we were, you know, yeah. Anyway, we, we, were, we got through about three quarters of the play replacing the text. It was fascinating, actually. And very emotional. And, and the actors who are in that production say to this day that that was the most emotional, emotionally rich, those relationships between those four characters are rich, uh, experience they'd had. Um, we got to the Vol Purchase Notch section. And we had used so much quantum and astral text. And we were sitting in a circle, really stuck about what comes next. And somebody said, the Bible. Oh my God. And we ran and got a Bible. This was in, wow. This was in the days before the internet. We ran and got a Bible. And we ended up using text from Genesis <coughs> and from Revelations. And it was deeply satisfying, and it worked with the play. Um, if you want to imagine what the play looked like, it was, it was literally, we did it at the Humana Festival of New, of New American Plays, uh, and it was, there was a white couch on wheels, there was a door frame, uh, there was a drink cart where every drink had a different color that was sort of lit, and it was on wheels too, and then an elastic white, what do you call it, a uh, white elastic. <laughs> That made made that defined the room, and we would say, everybody, if you're inside of this room, you are in what they call in physics classical space, which means like you, now we're probably imagining each other in classical space. We're functioning in classical space. If you step outside the room, you're in quantum space. I didn't really know what that meant at the time. <laughs> and poor K.J. Sanchez, who was playing um, uh, Honey. She's always going to the bathroom, if you know the play, right? So she'd have to leave the room, and she'd be out there in quantum space during rehearsal. And she kept going, Anne, I'm in quantum space. What do I do? <laughs> anyway, I'm getting to the, to the book. This story is not in the book, I don't think. Uh, 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 we opened, and as I said, it was a very powerful emotional experience. But something about going back to the Bible when you've deconstructed to a point where you can't do it anymore. You have to go to something primal. And I remember waiting for the um, elevator at, at, at Actors Theater with, with Michael Dixon, the dramaturg, who, the literary manager, who was dramaturging this production. He said, he said, Anne, you guys have done it. You, you've come to the end of postmodernism, and you've found the beginning of the next thing. You, you're starting to create meaning again. It took me a, a couple of years to understand the profundity of this at least for myself, to understand that, um, that the issue of story is uh, uh, newly important. And there are, I think, playwrights right now um, who, who are writing in ways that ask that question. Um, uh, uh, I'm thinking Anna DeVere Smith, for example, is a good example of somebody who's saying, whose story am I telling? I think Moises in the Tectonic uh, Theater Company. I think that, I think, Tony Kushner is doing it. A lot of people are actually asking whose stories are we telling what, and, and, and how do we tell them and who are they for. So this book is, um, is an embracing of, of the fact that I've always loved stories, that I actually teach through stories. In other words, um, there's a couple of students I've had in this room very right now. Uh, and wouldn't you say that's true, Jimmy? It's like when I, when I try to teach something about directing, I basically tell the story of how I learned it. And that that actually creates emotion. 
And if you don't create, if you don't have emotion, you don't remember anything. That, that emotion is the heat that creates the protein that is a thing called memory that has a synaptical connection that you can access. And so stories create empathy, which create, uh, which create uh, 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 points of view about life. Facts never change anybody's, right? You've tried to tell facts to Republicans. Um, <laughs> or Republicans have tried to tell me facts, and it just doesn't work. But tell me a story if I can actually start to live inside this mini universe that is a story, I can start to care, start to see through other people's eyes. And so the book is very much looking from a postmodernist point of view about the, uh, our awkward attempts to tell stories again. Uh, Brad, are you happy now? More or less. I'm so, I mean, I don't want to hog this when you ask. Um, I still have a question about the, the suspicion that would necessarily arrive, arise. The uh, suspicion about well, you know, you're telling me this story now after after postmodernism. Why are you telling me this, and how much of it is true, and why should I believe you, and why should you be telling the story and not someone else, and you know, which part of the story is true, which part isn't true, is any of it true? It just seems like there's a a certain kind of suspicion that would linger. Yeah, and that is the postmodernist dilemma, and which is why there's no political action happening right now. Yeah. It's because we think we don't, everything's relative, we have no right to privilege one story over another, but I think we, in fact, do, and that we are responsible to, to say whose stories should we tell. You know, um, I think after uh, 12 Years a Slave came out, which is, I think you might agree with me, is a great film. Terry Gross of Fresh Air, of Fresh Air fame, was so obsessed with that film that she invited onto her program um, a, a man who was um, an historian who knew a lot about post-Civil War Reconstruction. And she brought him on to discuss 12 Years a Slave. And at a certain point, she, um, <coughs> Terry Gross asked him, why this story? Why 12 Years a Slave? Why not another story? And he said, because there's hardly any stories that survive. Because of the circumstances of slavery, because of the lack of education, the lack of the available uh, communion of stories, this story matters. And, and, and I think that also in relationship to, in, in, in um, uh, uh, that stories help us from keeping off, falling off the edge of the earth and being forgotten. And it, to me, the theater is, if it were a verb, it would be to remember, to put things back together again, to remember. And so the question is, what are we remembering? What has value for whom? Um, and it's a huge, it's just huge opportunity to tell a story. And it is a cop out at this point to say, I don't have the right to tell the story because one privilege is over the other. Do you, you know what I'm saying? And I think it's, I think it's, it's a, a, po a politics that grew out of the McCarthy era where we were robbed of our relationship to, as artists to the, the world we live in, to politics. Um, Leon, thank you. It, it seems to me, and this is, I don't think this is necessarily a new thought, but I'm struck by the fact that both of you have been talking about listening more than you've been talking about telling. And it, so it seems that you know, there's a thing that happens and then there's a story that's told about that, that in one way or another references that thing that happened. But that story doesn't happen until it's heard. Mm -hmm. And so it seems what you're saying is that stories are things that you hear not things that you tell. And I wonder if that's, I wonder if you would comment on that. Well, or I'm thinking of John I, Cage. I, I, guess. I, I know, and, 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 and I'm thinking of um, the role of the audience <coughs> and the sacredness of that in the theater.
and the role of participation in the theater as opposed to other art forms that um, that don't demand that kind of participation, the empathic participation. Um, and it was, I think, um, Alfred Brendel who said, uh, no, he was, it was, A. Alvarez wrote, uh, wrote an article about Alfred Brendel, the great uh, pianist who's famous for his, um, for his Beethoven. And one day, and I guess they live in a similar area in, in uh, the same neighborhood in, uh, in London. One day, Alfred Brendel called up A. Alvarez and said, uh, would you come over? I'm rehearsing for a concert, um, and I need you to come over. So A. Alvarez went over to <coughs> Alfred Brendel's house, and Alfred Brendel brought him into his um, salon with the big piano, and there was a chair set up for him. And Mr. Alvarez was very nervous because he said, <coughs> Brendel said, please sit here. I'm going to play you what I'm going to play in the next concert. And Brendel thought, oh my god, what am I supposed to give Brendel? I mean, Alvarez thought, am I supposed to give Brendel notes on his playing? Like, what am I doing sitting here? But what he realized that is, that, is that Brendel couldn't practice without that person sitting there. And I think that a great artist is a lover of the art. Um, I, I, Rena and I were in, in, in California last week, and, and we took out the, follow this, the boyfriend of my niece to dinner. We were with my niece and with my brother and his wife. And, and my niece's boyfriend is an artist. And uh, it looks like, he, yeah, you're, you're going, well, maybe he's not an artist. He actually, he, actually, he actually looked really stoned, basically. I think he's a stoned. Anyway, so at one point I said, well, to this guy, I said, Ian, what, what, what is interesting to you? What, who, who, who are your influences? He's at uh, the San Francisco Art Institute. And he's graduating. He said, no, nobody. No one. Well, I get confused if I think about anybody else. It's just me and, and, the, and the art. And then Rena said, well, maybe don't think about who has influenced you, but what works of art have influenced you? He said, no, I can't tell you anything. It's not like I don't see them, but I can't tell you. I, no. We'll see. He might turn out to be the next Pollock. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it's the relations that we create with the storyteller that makes us makes us complicit. Do, do you see where I'm, I'm trying to get at a circular situation? Jimmy has a is going to help me out here. I think just in response to what you the way you tell stories and the way that I maybe have heard multiple stories many times <laughs> when uh, when you the context of a story uh, allows people to enter it at different moments and apply it for different situations or different moments in their own lives. Right. So I think it's what you're saying is it being the, th the thing that's outside of you that needs to be contextualized and yeah. and entered into. And, and I think if a story is universal enough, Shakespeare, for instance, it won't go away. We just may just rediscover it or re-enter it at different moments and complete that circle, like you're saying. Like you're saying you know. I, I remember when I had, I'm being awfully naked here, but when I had, um, uh, I went through a cancer experience, and I had a phone call with my then friend Anne Catania, from, who's now at Lincoln Center, and she said, Anne, you'll never read King Lear the same. It will never be the same to you again. It's a completely different play. And she's right, you know, that I think you're absolutely right that your experience gives you a relationship to the story. I mean, you, you, you're, you're always quoting Aristotle about that we live only in relation to others. Mm -hmm. I think it's true that we live in relationship not only to others, but to what others create. Mm -hmm. What is that quote? Well, it, uh, human beings become who they are in their relationships with other human beings. But, and this is why um, <clears throat> when Philoctetes was on a desert island, he wanted to come back to town because he understood that alone on a desert island, he was not quite a human being. Mm -hmm. And I worry about my cousins, my nieces. Did I say cousin before? Nieces' boyfriend. 
You see. He's not in relation. <laughs> I've been getting so much trouble. <laughs> this is live stream. <laughs> yes. Going back a little bit. Um, you said after, after reading Haw the Hawkins article that you felt that you needed to go back to what you called story and therefore you chose the Bible. And my question is, why did you choose the Bible instead of the Big Bang Theory? It seems almost... either hypocritical or fearful or... I, it, it, it doesn't seem um, rational. I can, I can, I understand completely why you're asking that, and and I would probably, in your place, ask the same thing. Trust me, we had done the Big Bang Theory already in that play. We've been through that, and it isn't rational. And in the way that I don't think religion is rational. Is rational. I do. Not. Yeah, and and it was not a rational choice. Oh, you, you admit it was not rational. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. All I can say is it felt to be the right thing. And hearing those words at that moment, which was in the play, the moment when they're completely drunk, it's completely late, nobody's making any sense anymore, and returning to that felt true. Mm. I understand your problem with the Bible. Yeah. So this, this says a lot about language, doesn't it? That you, you had them memorize the play with some of the words of uh, Edward Albee, and uh, we're talking about listening, understanding, empathetic uh, stuff, telling a story that, as uh, uh, Leon said, uh, it's about hearing it and how we hear it. So when you change the language, and the language is um, perhaps... Uh, unperceivable, unperceptible to the audience, but they see the bodies in space, as we do in all your work so beautifully, it means something because of action, uh, I would call it. Uh, what does it mean then to be postmodern or post-postmodern and take away language that people understand and use something else? It's, it's, it's an interesting question because Language is about action, really. I can say I love you, and I can do it 10 different ways. It'll mean 10 different things. I could say one, two, three, four, five, and mean I love you. So are you saying that language is less important as we go on? What is important in the story, if, if you take away language? No, on the contrary, um, language is, I think, become more and more important, especially to use properly. But, and so, in speaking of the play Going, Going, Gone, that's a very particular experience where I wanted the audience to give up understanding and then to get it later. So I, I wish I could remember because I can't remember any of the lines from it. But you know how it starts with, what a dump, she says, right? Huh? What a dump. And I wish I could remember the first lines. That's how bad my memory is in that. After about four minutes, or maybe one and a half, the audience went, what? I don't understand a word. And they started getting engaged in the action and could follow it, and were following the story. And yet, the language was working on them in the same way that those books on tapes were working on, on me. And little by little, little by little, the language did actually make sense. And, and I, I mean, I haven't had that experience yet. I haven't had the patience to read James Joyce, but I bet I could have that experience with, with his writing. I also have a problem with his misogyny, but it, 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 I bet I could have that experience with, I haven't read all of Proust. Rena, you've read all of Proust. I think I could have that experience. No, that's easier. I think I'd stick with Joyce, <laughs> which maybe is as complicated as the, the scientific writings on quantum physics. So in this case, this is a very special case. I do believe in language. I believe in using language well, in finding the right words that open doors. 
Um, I think language is more important than ever. Um, and, but I also think there are many languages. Uh, we're, City Company is working right now on a, on a project at the Cranert Center in Illinois. And it's called Making Communities Visible. And it's a little bit part of this project, which is uh, Mike Ross, who runs the Cranert Center, which is, for those who don't know the Cranert Center, it's like the Lincoln Center of the prairies. It's in the middle of Illinois. And it's a monolithic, uh, massive building full, full of, of concert halls and many huge theaters and, 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 and fancy, um, fancy, fancy, uh, uh, the, the, the word for this is lobbies, <laughs> very large lobbies. And, and the, the project is started by Mike Ross, who's the director of the Credit Center, who said, there's a lot of people who live in the area of Champaign-Urbana, where it is, who never come to us because it's too exclusive, because they're scared of it, because it's like this big monolith. And we started to create a, uh, this project, which in the end would bring communities that never go into this art palace to come. So they, they, they located uh, four communities from Champaign-Urbana that we, um, uh, Leon has been in this, this journey, um, that we would create relationships with and over the course of two years, actually three, would, they would actually end up performing something performative in the building that would make their community visible. And the, the four communities are, because we're in the middle of it, one is a faith-based African-American community in a neighborhood uh, that, that, that's being uh, <coughs> ripped down, um, torn apart. Another is first through fifth graders uh, bilingual. Uh, 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 another one is community leaders who lead things like the Boys and Girls Club of, but, uh, but who, 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 um, who deal with people who never come to the Cranard. And, the, um, and, and one other group is, is uh, what they call first generations. These were, these were um, communities identified by the Cranard Center. They looked around, they said, what people never use us, never come here. So the last one is, is uh, first generation um, uh, college students. And each community is phenomenal, and they have their own stories. And um, oh, I just parenthetically want to tell, since I'm telling stories, the African American faith based community, which we met, the first time we met with them was in an abandoned crack house that had been taken over by this wonderful reverend. And everyone in those meetings said, whatever we do, whatever we create, it cannot. It must be full of joy. It can't be about our problems. You know, we thought, let's make a, let's make a show about your problems. And, uh, and, and we said, well, what would you like to do? And they said, dream girls. We want to do dream girls <laughs> in the Cranor. Fantastic. But I'm getting to this issue of language, actually. Uh, extraordinary meeting with this young 18, 19, 20-year-olds, first-generation students whose families had never never gone to college. They're, in a way, swimming through this experience. And we started talking about what they could do, what, how they would make their community visible. And at one point, this, this beautiful young woman said, said, yeah, my best friend and I, every Friday, we go out into the world without our cell phones. That's what we've decided to do. And it's a big deal. We have a completely different experience of the world without our cell phones. We like talk to each other. We look at things. <laughs> and of course, we at City Company, we started going, really? That's interesting. And then another one of these young people said, yeah. And we started creating an idea that they're going to create a tech-free zone where you have to give up your cell phone, go in and have interactive art experiences in the one part of the building. This, this other young woman, she said, yeah, I understand that because we're always doing this, we have lost the ability to read body language. Extraordinary. And extraordinary that it came from them. And they all assented, yes, this is what we want to do. We want to create a tech-free <coughs> environment. I find hope in the universe about this. But this is going back to your question about language. Body language is a skill that we take too much for granted and that I think we're losing, in a sense. And that there are many languages in the theater. And the theater is a translation of, of, <coughs> of, of, the, of, of, of literature into the languages of time and space. 
And what are those languages is a question. So stories come in many forms. So a long answer to your provocative word, word question. Did I hear you say language is more important than action? Mm, did I say that? I hope not. You know, my favorite, my favorite definition of theater. I mean, do you believe that? No, I, 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 I'm having a little trouble hearing you, so it might, you might not have said action, but I think you did. Did anybody else hear that? I did make a language. I do know that, say, love is action. It's not words. So I think, I think action leads. I mean, one can I, talk. I, I want to make sure that that's what you do, action leads. I'm Absolutely. Actually, yeah. I, I don't see any how it's possible. Action is always more important. I yeah, but what creates power of action speaks louder than the words. Right? Absolutely. But then what creates action or clear action is thought. Thought precedes action. And the development of thought is developed through language. So it's a complicated uh, uh, semantics. Hallelujah. <laughs> so I agree. I agree that action is absolutely most important. And I think, you know, I, 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 Leon has heard this ad nausea, but my favorite definition of the theater, and you know, I'm a performance studies junkie. I like to read it like, like detective novels. I like to read performance theory. And um, the best definition of the theater I've ever read is by Paul Woodruff, the, the philosopher in the, in the book, The Necessity of Theater. He said, theater is the art form wherein human beings make human action worth watching within a time, a specific time, <laughs> defined time and space. Theater is the art form wherein human beings make human action worth watching within a defined time and space. Extraordinary definition, which then instantly throws the gauntlet down, which is how do you make action worth watching? It's essential. So <laughs> I'll stop there before I get in more trouble with you. There's a lot of bad questions to Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody? Yes. Hi, uh, Chuck. Um, hey, Chuck. Uh, thanks. Uh, so I can't speak to the to the book, unfortunately, because I have yet to read it. Um, but I'm familiar with both your work and. Uh, whether it's Trojan Women or Big Love or The Persians, uh, there's this recall to the classics, and it's almost like you're time travelers or, or historians. You're bringing the past to the to the modern day, and whether it's a retelling or a reimagining, you know, reimagining uh, or reimagination. They're using that word a lot with uh, uh, remakes of movies and TV series. Um, but anyway, uh, so. In today's climate, with assimilation being a very uh, American thing of a homogenization of culture, uh, assimilating to uh, whether it's cisgender or uh, you know our Protestant Anglo idea ideals or puritanical ideals of you know first settlers, whether or not you you know Massachusetts colony, um, with assimilation and capitalism and commercial interest involved in the entertainment industry and in the culture. Um, how, how do you navigate that? What do you think we should do or what are you doing? I mean, we're writing, you're writing this book, we're having this talk right now um, as, as storytellers, because I feel like we are yearning for a connection to the past, whether it's back to ancient Greece or Egypt or uh, Persia or Macedonia, you know, we're looking to reconnect with our past and what makes us us, makes us human. Um, and I think that's a struggle because we've kind of lost some sense of our uh, human identity, even with what you're saying about um, reading body language and uh, technology actually getting in the way, um, what, rather than helping man, it's, it's sort of uh, uh, holding us back. Uh, and I can speak to that from my own personal experience as a, a server in a restaurant, just the social skills and the, the lack thereof oh, yeah. is um, unsettling at times and, you know, at times, I can use it to my advantage, and other times, it's a huge disadvantage. But um, you know, that's speaking as a salesman. But well, so, what are your thoughts on that? Because it seems like this is something that excites both of you, 
Um, and, and it excites me as an audience member and as an artist. Um, so what, what do we do? Do we keep having these talks and write books to spread the word and, and hope? <laughs> Chuck, you go back to the classics a lot. Yeah. Well, I go back to the classics because, you know, we were all told in school and we're told repeatedly since then <clears throat> that the greatest playwrights in the Western world are the Greeks and Shakespeare. And neither the Greeks nor Shakespeare ever wrote an original play. They always took something and redid it. Uh, and so if you take something from the Greeks today and remake it, you're asking yourself and people who come to see it, are we the same human beings? Uh, is it still relevant? Um, is it still alive? Uh, and do we want some of these things to still be alive? Or do we wish we could change some of these things? I mean, that's what the Greeks were saying when they gathered in the evening to look at a, to look at a play, to wonder, is this how we, be? If, 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 I don't know if you've ever been to uh, uh, a theater in Greece, but many of the theaters in Greece, you think that the great theater would be constructed so that you could look out onto the countryside as you watch the play, but most of them, you look at the city in the background because that's where people live. <coughs> so they look at the play on stage and behind the stage they see the town where they live and they watch people behaving in the context of that town and they wonder, could we do better than that? <laughs> so we're still wondering the same thing today. I would add to that too that it's tempting to be overwhelmed by the problems and issues that seem insurmountable. I would not underestimate the power of what you can do in a small room. And it's called, I didn't coin this phrase, I think there's a book of this title called Revolutions in Small Rooms. And I know growing into the theater world, I saw it happen very clearly in the theater in New York, which was chorus line would never have happened without Joe Chaikin and the open theater. In other words, the innovations that were happening in those small rooms were that totally blew up the dramaturgy of how a play is constructed. And that's happened over and over again. And in addition to how a play is created, in a small room, you create a small social system. You create a politics of a group of people. And as Chuck always says, the theater is uniquely, and what makes it different from any other art form, it is about social systems. It is the only art form that is subject matter is how are we getting along? How can we get along better? How are the actors getting along? How is the audience getting along? How are the actors and the audience getting along? Certainly every play is about a, a, a social system that's usually quite screwed up. Somebody killed their father and slept with their mother and there's problems. You know, there's and that the play is a progression through disharmony to harmony, usually, with, with grief, usually, if it's a tragedy. So in, in the theater, we have these layers, which is we have the fictional layer of the play, which is about how we're getting along. And it's usually people who are very screwed up. The paradox is that an audience sees two plays at the same time. They're aware of one because it happens to the prefrontal cortex of the brain, which is the story. But they're also getting another story, going back to the languages of the stage, which is how these particular human beings are getting along on the stage right now. And it, I think the reason why uh, Stanislavski and the uh, Moscow Art Theater's first trip to the United States in 1922-23 was so radical was not because they had a new method of acting, but that people had never seen people be together that way. And in, the, in those moments, you know, those people who, 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 who were knocked out by what they saw, who's, who were young, young people whose names were Strasberg, Stella Adler, 
Harold Glerman, who saw this and said, we, we have to do something in the theater. We have to change the theater. They were responding to this new social system. But the new social system was also related to the breakthroughs in science and art of that time, of between, of, from, from 1905 to 1923, when they were in the States, was the explosion of, of cubism, or was the uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, certain breakthroughs of, of, of Freud and Pavlov and the, uh, the, the, the Einstein and Eisenstein, you know, all of them. And so what the theater does is it looks at a world that is going through paradigmatic changes, which we are doing right now, and finds a way to show how human beings can function together in a way that works. So what, what I think people were looking at in 1923, 2022 was they had never seen theater in which there was not, you know, we come from a theater that's from melodrama with the lead actor and the backup chorus. They were seeing a social system functioning together in a way that was completely radical. I think the reason why there is such a strong response to the viewpoints in the theater is because when you watch that work, you are seeing a different way of people getting along that is in another way not hierarchical, that actually expresses a way to be together in the light of changes in technology that are radically changing our lives right now. I'm going on a tangent. But to your question, I would just say it matters what you do in a room with a group of people. In the theater, that's what we do. It matters how you talk to each other. It matters how you structure time. It matters how you listen to one another, how you respect one another. And out of that can be born uh, uh, proposals about the way we might function together and flourish as human beings together socially. We have, um, we, we've gone over our hour. Um, we can continue this conversation. Um, wait a minute, you're supposed to do this. Over martinis? You're, you're the moderator. Yeah. <laughs> OK, that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for coming tonight. Thank you for coming.